Well, welcome to NVTV. Now, it's normally Julian here doing this, but we didn't tell him. <laughs> so, welcome to the Jerry Kelly Show, the one and only Jerry Kelly. No, not the one and only, but the one that's on the television. You know what I mean? Here he comes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Jerry Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to the programme. Now, for over 20 years, my first guest had become a regular feature on some of the most iconic TV shows this century. He's managed some of the most successful music acts ever to come out of Ireland and the UK, boy bands and individual artists who have sold literally millions of records worldwide. He has the uncanny knack of spotting talent, sometimes raw talent, and turning them into superstars. It can only be one man. Would you please welcome Louis Walsh. <laughs> You said millions of records. Millions. Hundreds of millions. Hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. Well, it's good to see you because we haven't seen you on television in a while. What, what are you at at the minute? Um, well, X Factor's not on anymore. No. So I'm retired from the TV. I'm still working with Westlife and I'm launching a new band. I'm working with one called Next in Line. Yes, I've heard Five that. Five Irish I've boys just that. working. And I'm living in Dublin and I'm having a good time. I'm enjoying life. I'll talk to you obviously about what you're doing now and how you're enjoying life. But can I take you back to... The old Louis Walsh, the young Louis Walsh, yeah. before you became this television megastar. You were sort of hanging around the, the show bands and the, and the dance halls of Ireland. Is that in, how you learned the trade? In County Mayo, yeah. In our, Doing yeah. what, Louis? Just wanting to be in the music business. I didn't want to do a real job. You know, it just wouldn't suit me. And I just love music. And I'm, I'm a big music fan, all kinds of music. And the show bands I loved, my favourite show band were the Freshmen. Yes, from, from here, up here, of course. Amazing. Yes. And then Chips, amazing. From here as well. And I got to learn the business. There was a band from Mayo called the Royal Blues. Yes. They had a manager in Dublin called Tommy Hayden. The Royal Blues got me a job working in Tommy Hayden's office, and I was the gopher. So were you, you were the gopher? You were, Go, were you booking was, bands? Were you? Not at the start. No, I was making tea and answering the fan mail, answering the phone and doing the posters and learning the game. So how long did you stay at that? I was doing that for two or three years, and then gradually I started managing bands. Chips were one. Yeah. Johnny Logan. Yeah. Bruce Shields, Rob Strong, loads of people. But you must have known when the show band era happened, they were huge here. Huge. But they weren't going to make it in England. Most of them didn't, apart from Not Joe Dolan. Joe Dolan, actually, yes. Um, but they were doing really well in Ireland. They were working maybe six, seven nights a week, and it was a great living. And yeah. it was like, you know, we made good money. And I loved it. I'm a, I'm a music fan, number one, you see. Yeah. So then the whole show band thing came to an end. I saw Take That in The Point in Dublin. And I thought, I'll do an Irish Take That. We put the ad on the paper. But before you go to Take That and doing the Irish okay. one, oh, Johnny Logan. you mentioned Johnny Logan. That, that was your breakthrough, wasn't now it? That was 1980, Jerry. Right. And I, I, I met Johnny Logan on a bus. Believe it or not, we started working together. He wanted to do Eurovision. We got this song from Shea Healy called What's Another Year? Yes. I didn't think it was going to win, really? so I was wrong. We went to The Hague and he won Eurovision. That was 1980, and that was the start of me going international with him. Right. Going to all the TV shows, Top of the Pops, going to Germany, going all around Europe. And therefore, Take That then was happening at the time. Then, after that, I saw Take That, and I thought, that's, that's a great show. I'd love to do an Irish take that, like like a, a tribute band almost. Yes. Yeah. You know? So I put an ad on the paper. The phone started ringing. I got 150 people, and that was Boys On. But the first night that they appeared on television on the Late Late Show. On the Late Late Show. I saw it that night. I thought these guys won't last a week. It was Gate Burn thought the same it thing. It was yeah. embarrassingly bad. It was. The first night. But. I had just picked them on the Thursday. The producer called me, Bridget, she called me and said, will you come to do the Late Late Show on Friday? I didn't think to say no. I just said, yeah, of course, it's a big show. They'd never been on TV. They'd never been anywhere. 
But I think the clip shows that anybody can make it if they work at it. But what did you see in them? I was naive. I was naive and I saw a massive gap in the market for Irish girls having their own boy band. And that was really it. And I picked all the songs and I picked, I picked Ronan and Stephen and then I put the other three around them. We were on your show a lot. Oh, a lot. A you lot. know the real story. Yes, I do know part of the real story. Yeah. But not only were you satisfied with Boys Own, you then came to Westlife. You did it again. You repeated it. I did that with Simon Cowell as well. I, I got to work with him. And there was a band from Sligo called IOU and I met them and I got Simon in to see them. He says, change them get rid of four of them and put more in and I'll take them. So I actually got rid of three, got a note, put in Nicky and Brian McFadden and we had Westlife and I had Simon and we had great songs and it's like it's still working, it's massive. All around the world it's massive. You've mentioned Simon Kyle. How, how, how did you and he meet? How big mates are you? Or is it all just for television, this, this no, relationship no. between the two? No, I, he's great. I love working with him. I really love him. I worked with him for like 20 years on Westlife, so I'd be talking to him every day. So that's why he put me on TV, because he knew I knew a little bit about music and stuff and songs. And um, I met him first at Kenny Live in RTE. Yeah. And he wouldn't take my calls and I was trying to sell Boy Sound. So I met him at Kenny Live. He was with these two boys, Robson and Jerome. Yes, we know. And I said, Simon, I'm Louis Walsh. Da, da, da. He was, yes, darling, no, darling. You know, he's very camp. And <laughs> <laughs> he is. <laughs> He invented camp. But um, so then he said, we worked together. So then I called him and we just got on well. He's great fun. And he's, if he believes in an actor, he just goes for it. And he believed in Wesley and he made it work. But you, you went on to X Factor and, and Britain's they Got Talent. They put me on X Factor yes, and Britain's Yes, but I always thought, Lou, you were a reluctant performer. That you really didn't want wanted, television. I didn't want to be on TV. But they offered me loads of money. <laughs> Fair enough. Good enough reason. Really good money. How difficult was it though at the start to, to be Louis Walsh? The Very performer? difficult because on the first night it was Simon Cowell, Sharon Osbourne and me and nobody knew me. Yes, you know? yes. And they're two big, big characters. So it wasn't easy, but gra I gradually grew into it. And did you enjoy it at the end? Yes, very much. I did it for 15 years, Terry. Why were you taken off it? Because the show finished. It's over. And he, he, he changed me a few times, but then he brought me back. Yes. Um, you know, formats on TV, they get tired and people have to change them, you know, and it was a brilliant talent show at the time. I mean, there was no other talent show like it. Everybody watched it. True. And it was all real. It wasn't staged. Really? Everything was real, honestly, all real. And that's what made it. You had the good, the bad and the ugly. You had a couple of winners out of it too, didn't you? I had Shane Ward, Shane. Series 2. G4 did pretty well. Yes. JLS, you know the story <laughs> with them. I wanted them to win. Yes. And the week of the final, I'm sure they're going to win. And I'm plotting, I'm going to get Westlife. So I got Westlife and JLS to do a duet. Cheryl had Alexander Burke. Simon loved Cheryl. Let's just leave it at that. He loved her. So whatever she wanted, she got. So what did he get her? He got her Beyonce. Oh. He got her Beyonce, did a duet. That was it. Oh. But it was all real, Jerry. We were, we were, we were rivals. Is there anybody, looking back now on, on your career, is there anybody that you missed out on that went on to be huge that you turned down? I don't know. I work with Samantha Mamba. Who else do I work with? I'm sure there's bands, but I never wanted to do rock bands. I only wanted to do pop, because yes. I like pop. So what qualities do you need, Louis, to control and to develop and to mature young fellas like Boys Own or Take That or uh, Westlife, Westlife to become the stars that they become? Well... You need good songs. If you've got good songs and a good work ethic. Yeah. I think being Irish helps as well. So what was your role as manager? Getting the songs? I used to always get the songs. But your PR was good with them. Like yeah. I remember the first, the first night the guys were on Kelly. Yeah. You sent them up to the green room to make sure that they said goodbye to me. Oh, yeah. And they all called me Mr. Kelly on the way Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's what you do if you're a professional. You talk to everybody. I remember when Michael Bublé would come on X Factor and Taylor Swift, they're the two people, they would thank everybody in the room. I was very impressed with that, I have to say. Very everybody impressed. did that. Well, I told them to do it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to get back in the show. But you know, I'm very impressed. And you know what, Jerry? you were really good to us. You always had boys on back, you always had Westlife, you had Six, you had Samantha. Huge you had all time. my acts, but they became huge because you put them on TV as well. Can okay. I ask about 
There's been a lot in the press and a lot has been written Go about on. the rift between you and Ronan Keating. Oh. Is it irreparable? <sighs> well, I picked all the songs. I'm going to be honest with you. I picked every single song when he was having hits. So I was kind of, and I, I, I worked really hard. And he was great to work with. He was fantastic to work with. And he was, he was very ambitious. And then one day he called me and we met in the Intercontinental. And he says, I don't want to be a karaoke artist anymore. Well, you're not a songwriter, you know. So we fell out. He got rid of me and he had no more hits. <laughs> and I got Westlife. That's the truth. I, I, but he I, I was great to work with then. I understand, but it saddens me, Louis. Next year, it'll be 30 years since you and he got together. Really? Yes, Boys Own started I in I bet 19. he regrets it now. But I mean, is it, you know, the things... The things, that, the things that were said uh, between you. Do, do you regret the things that were said no, between you? No, I just say things. I just say things like, like, like they are. You know, I can't take it back. But do you not feel any sadness that you won't be together for a 30th anniversary concert? No. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, no. Really? It's over yet. It's done. It's done? It's done. He was, he was great to work with at the time. He really was. So you're moving but on. Sometimes you create monsters. Yeah. And they bite your head off. <laughs> You're a tough man, Lou. I'm not. I'm just. I'm just telling you the truth about the business. But you we have to create be monsters. But you are tough. You are tough. Do yeah. you have? Do you have to be tough? Do you have to have that attitude to, to be, be a survivor? The success, to be a success. Yeah, but you have to tell it like it is. And you can only work with people you believe in, and people you trust. You know. And there's very little loyalty in the music business. You know. I was told this. If you want loyalty, you buy a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Louis, we could. Talk here all night. Oh, we, we, I'll come back again. I want you to get your own show. Oh, stop that. On either stop that, BBC stop that, stop or ITV. Right, <laughs> Jerry, <laughs> I want you to yeah. get your own show. I'd probably fall out with you after I'd You probably yeah, would, but probably that's OK. I'd like you to get the show. <laughs> Louis, you're very kind, but thank you so much. I want you to stay on. Is that it? I want you to stay on. No, it's not. In the meantime, will you please thank Louis Walsh, <laughs> who tells the truth. <laughs> I want Louis to stay on. Uh, because I, I, I want to introduce you to someone because I know Louis, uh, and you, there, now, if you were watching the uh, Brits Got Talent in 2016, uh, a magician won it that night and was the first magician ever to win it. Now tonight I want you and the people here and the people at home and I want Louis to be mesmerised by one of the slickest, cleverest magicians in the business today. He comes from Coleraine and he performs his incredible magic all over the world. Would you give a big hand please to Rod Hogg? Hi Rod. How are you doing? Have a seat. And how are you, Rod? I'm very well. Living Good. the dream. You're living the dream, are you? It's better than saying not too bad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you are a member of the inner circle I of am. magicians. As of last week, yes. I was invited into the inner magic circle in London. Well, wait a minute now. There's a magic circle and then there's an inner magic circle. Yeah, well, it's all one and the same, but within the magic circle there's a, an inner sector. And how do you get into the inner sector? I don't know. I don't know how it happened. It just happened. You're good. <laughs> they didn't. You're good at your gig. Yes, but how, who did you have to prove you were good to? Well, I've the past six months I've started to teach. I'm, I'm a pickpocket as well as a magician, so... <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's no money in here anyway. Never, never had no. He's all the money. I've noticed where you have everything now. But listen, me trying to pickpocket you here now is like trying to rob your house whenever you're at home, so it's not going to work. We're right not going to so pickpocket, that's good. So how did you get in then? Did you have to do an audition to get in? It, originally in 2014, when I applied to join the Magic Circle in London, I went over and did an audition. And in front of other magicians? In front of about 50 magicians. A 12-minute act, and then there's three judges or three examiners, and then at the end of the day, they decide whether you get in or don't. Thankfully, I got in, and as the last six months, I've started to teach pickpocketing, and they asked me... Who too? Who have you been teaching pickpocketing to? <laughs> Anyone who wants to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Magicians, oh, magicians. Magicians. Yeah. Yeah. Magicians. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I met people on the street. <laughs> I thought you should go okay. down to the train station. I was going to say something, but I won't. <laughs> no, don't. No. Uh, congratulations on that. Well, I'm just you. getting into the inner circle. Yeah, so and is it true that you are not allowed to tell anyone how you do the trick? Uh, is well, that a rule? That's like etiquette. Oh, is so it only etiquette or is it a well, rule of the circle? Uh, the rule of the circle. People have been thrown out of the circle for exposing secrets, yeah. Really? Yeah. So, you know, in my job, it's important that the, the trick isn't exposed or seen. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's where the that's magic your, lies. That's your yeah. job. 
So, any, so any magician who would sell it for money or whatever reason, they, uh, they deserve well, to be thrown out. Well, what about just mate and you show me how you do it? Uh, it wouldn't happen. No. I don't have any mates, so... That's very true. <laughs> well, then, will you show Louis and I something? Would you like to see something? I would yeah. love to see a trick. Okay. Well, soon we're all here. Cards isn't really my thing. Okay. But I'm going to... I'm going to use a deck of cards. Okay. Because I need one card. Okay. Are you familiar with a deck of cards? Sort of. Okay. Yes. Can you name just name a random card? Now, not the Ace of Spades or the Queen of Hearts or the Kings. Name a random one. Nine of Clubs. No. Any reason why? No. Totally random. Mm -hmm. Nine of Clubs. Mm -hmm. Nine of Clubs. Come on. Nine of Clubs. Let's see. I'm just going to give you the Nine of Clubs. <laughs> I don't know. This here. Well, there's one upside down. Oh okay. Is that the nine okay. of clubs? Yeah. <laughs> oh, now, that isn't actually the trick. I just needed the nine of clubs. Somehow it was the wrong way around there. Can you do me a favour, Lily? Could yeah. you roll up your, your left sleeve for me? This one? Well. Yeah. And can you... I'm not going to steal your watch in case you're wondering, because yeah, <laughs> I could, though. Can you hold your arm out there? <laughs> Bend your arm slightly. Pull it up a wee bit further. I know it's demanding, but... Keep watching. I'm watching the, the card. Yeah. You don't know where to watch, because... <laughs> Huh? Do you see in a few seconds, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes? Yeah. And when your eyes are closed, I'm going to touch you very gently with the yeah. card. Yeah, yeah. Your job's simple, just remember where yeah. and how many times. But don't speak until I ask you to in case you miss a touch and don't mm -hmm. open your eyes because I want you to focus. Okay. So relax yourself, take a deep breath in, breathe out and relax. Just be aware of what you feel. You watch Jerry. Yeah. But don't speak there. Just remember what you feel. Poke your face. Did you feel that way? Yeah. How many times? Once. Can you touch where? There. Open your eyes. Here? Like here? Yeah. Yeah. You never touched you, Louis. I touched Jerry's arm. <laughs> so who touched me? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, you, you felt me touch Jerry's arm? Yeah. That's interesting. That's very clever, isn't it? <laughs> That's why you're good at your game. Yeah. That's why he's good at you the might game. think maybe we're all in on it. Would you want to see it in reverse? Yeah. Yeah. And do you wanna do you wanna feel it? Yes. So come over a little bit. You can watch this time. So Jerry, again, when I ask you to close your eyes, just keep them closed. He'll be watching. He is watching closely. <laughs> just close your eyes, take a big deep breath in, relax, you can watch. Don't speak, Jerry, just remember what you feel. Don't open your eyes. Watch. Poke your face. Did you feel that, Jerry? Mm -hmm. How many times? Once. Just touch where? My nose. Here. Open your eyes. Right here. <laughs> Very good. Very good. That's why you're in the inner circle. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, you used to could be as well because you felt it because the magic only lies in the spectator's wow. mind. Wow. Do you want to take that stage further? I'll try. Do you want to? Yeah, you're up for it. <laughs> Can you stand for me? Mm -hmm. And if you just maybe just stand here, just come in here. Oh, I'll see this. No, yeah, <laughs> take, take a step back. Take a step back. Perfect. So I want you just to imagine a line down your body, separating your body into a, a right side and a left side. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, you're going to feel me tap you openly. So if I tap you anywhere on your left side, like for example here, just uh -huh. lift your left arm up okay. and then lower the arm. Similarly on your right side, if you feel a tap on your right side, just lift your right arm up okay. and then lower your arm. We'll just do it a few times so you get the gist. No, 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 no. Your left arm. your arm. Okay. 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 your arm. Yeah. So again. Perfect. Now you're getting it. And down again. You're okay with me tapping you, aren't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Tap away. And just lower again. Just get that movement going, that rhythm. Yeah. We'll do it a couple more times. Your right arm. And again, on your left arm. Okay, so this time I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. If you feel me touch you, just act accordingly. Right arm, left arm, okay? Okay. You'll see me and you'll hear me walking right the way around you. Take another deep breath in and just act accordingly.
So open your eyes there. Hey, did you feel all those touches? Yeah. I never touched you. He was nowhere near you. So who was doing it? <laughs> Really? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. He, was, he was nowhere near you. So what was it? I have no idea. Is it energy? Really? Well, whenever you see a piece of magic, there's three elements. There's the trick you see, the trick you don't see, and then the trick that you remember. And if I combine, or a magician combines all three into one, then that's the ultimate goal. Very good. So now you're even less the wiser. Absolutely. <laughs> you're still very good. I, I, I love it. I think it is absolutely fascinating. It's brilliant. Like I can see, I can understand card tricks, right? That's a yeah. Trick. But that one of touching. Yeah. And, you and touch I did feel it. Yeah. And I did too. Yeah. Could I be your glamorous assistant when we go away? <laughs> <laughs> assistant. Where, where else do you do you perform, Rod? Pretty much everywhere. Can you do, uh, could you do big so. theatre shows, for example, or, or is it all close-up stuff like this? No, I have in the past. I have done theatre shows, not so much since before COVID. Yes. Um, but yeah, I do. I have done it, but I think magic, or for the, what it is magic, I think it's stronger, up close, right this distance apart. Would you ever do Britain's Got Talent right those shows? <laughs> no. 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 Why not, Ro? Why not? Um, you mentioned the magician that won it. Yes. What was his name? I don't remember. We don't know. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, exactly. Sometimes magic doesn't work on TV. Yeah, and exactly. It doesn't yeah. transfer. Yeah. It's an art form that I think has to be seen it in person. It works here. Yeah. It certainly works. You're good. He's very good. He's very good. From Cole Rain, local man, local wow. boy. Rod, thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having Rod me. Rod Hogg, ladies and gentlemen. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to take a break, but uh, I'd like Louis. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very Louis much. Louis came up especially for us today, and he's heading straight back after the program. You always helped us, Terry. It's a joy to see you, Louis. Thank I still you. want you to get your own show. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. See you and then. And they want it too. Hello, my name is Cameron Davidson. I study level two FDQ at Belfast Met. I'm catering for the Jerry Kelly show and I want to run my own restaurant and be a head chef. Ready for an epic family day out? Then head over to the Jet Centre. Explore the excitement of Alley Cat Soft Play. Slide into action with hours of fun. While also getting time for a coffee break. Arcade more your thing? Say no more. Play games and win tickets. Feeling competitive? There's a game for everyone. Become gem mining experts at the Jet Centre. See what gems, stones, arrowheads or fossils you'll discover. Golf more your thing? Practice your game on the North Coast with mini golf. Lots of fun to be had on this 18 hole outdoor mini golf course or join us for bowling or a movie. The Jet Centre. Entertainment for everyone. Visit Antrim Town Centre and the award-winning Antrim Castle Gardens and make magical memories like never before. Embrace the giant Christmas spirit and experience the Enchanted Winter Garden. Book your tickets at EnchantedWinterGarden.com Brought to you by Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council. of shows to enjoy at the Grand Opera House in 2023. From West End and Broadway musicals to thrilling drama and many more sensational productions. Book your tickets at goh.co.uk.
Nestled in the Castlereagh Hills, you'll find Hillmount Garden Centre. Whether you're looking for winter plants to brighten your garden, a real Christmas tree or new Christmas decorations, you'll find it at Hillmount. Those gifts for all the family and gift vouchers for that one friend who's so difficult to buy for. There's everything from barbecues to pizza ovens and garden furniture. And you can shop these online too at hillmount.co.uk. After all the shopping, stop in at the Gardener's Rest and relax with a warming cuppa or enjoy a festive feast. Hillmount Garden Centre, Upper Braniel Road, Belfast. <laughs> Now, as you know, these Tonight with Jerry Kelly programmes are being made by many of my former colleagues at UTV, working alongside the media students here at the Belfast Metropolitan College. The idea being, of course, that the students will gain first-hand knowledge and experience of what the skills are that are required to put a television show together. So while we are doing our bit here, my next guest is creating much, much bigger opportunities. They're actually on a world stage. Would you please welcome the CEO of Northern Ireland Screen, Richard Williams. <laughs> well, good to see you. Richard, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that everybody knows the name Northern Ireland Screen because we see it on the end credits of many television and uh, shows and, and films. Sure, sure. What exactly is Northern Ireland Screen? What, what do you do? <laughs> That's a Tough question, what I do. Um, well, it, look, Northern Ireland Screen's job is to get as much value as we can out of the out of the screen industries for Northern Ireland. So, you know, we do a lot of things. We do a lot of skills development here. We're very supportive of what you're doing here in terms of um, giving students real opportunities in the sector. But I guess what we're what we're best known for is that we go out into the world, we go to Los Angeles, we go and we bring, you know, big projects back here yeah. to, to, to shoot in our... So what, what's our USP? What's our unique selling point? Why do Hollywood people and Americans and Europeans find Northern Ireland so attractive? Yeah, different reasons down the years, but now because we've got a great track record. You know, we've been doing this now for, you know, the guts of 20 years. We had, of course, you know, for 10 of those years, we had the number one television drama in the world you game know of, <laughs> yeah, you, you've got game of thrones here yeah yeah so that's that's a calling card but now we've got great studios we've got fantastic people we've got a fantastic crew um the uk is still a comfortable place for the screen industries they like they like the english language but you know people locations studios money and our skill set here amongst local people is growing as well yeah growing all the time how did you get Game of Thrones? How did you actually get them to come here? Because that was a major, <laughs> yeah, it major was a, coup. It was a, it was a major coup and um, different things. And we, we, we pulled together from our side a dream team to, to pitch key amongst that. We pulled in Mark Huffam, who's a producer of Big Stuff, already well known to Los Angeles and studios and HBO as somebody who could manage that sort of thing. He came into the team. We also, and it, you know, local government doesn't often get much credit from any of us, but we put a lot of money up to make a contribution to the pilot of Game of Thrones. Right. And of course, you know, at the pilot stage, nobody knew it was going to be the greatest TV of course, series of, of a decade. So, so basically, you know, we took a risk, a very calculated risk, because at the time HBO were by far the number one producer of TV, you know, quality TV drama in the world, and that risk paid off. Also, Jerry, of course, we had, and it, in the paint hall, now Titanic Studios, yeah. we had a huge building. Accidental asset from, the, from shipbuilding times, but a building that you could put huge sets in. So as well as our natural scenery that we had here, mm. We have this paint all this. Yeah. Anna, yeah. You're, you're getting something else very shortly too, something even bigger. Well, it, um, you know, nothing's as big at the start. Everything's big after the event. Right. Like, you know, Jerry Kelly. Jerry, Jerry Kelly's show at the start wasn't, wasn't big. It became, it became big. But yes, um, this starts from a very good place. Blade Runner's coming here. Blade Runner. Many, many in the audience will know, um, will have, you know, know the film Blade Runner. It's te this television version of Blade Runner, so that's 
that's um, the next big project. Is that to definitely come here. happening? Yeah, that's well, definitely. It's announced. It's announced. What does but all this mean to the to the Northern Ireland economy? How how, how do we benefit from this? Yeah. Well, the big stuff, you know, spends north of thirty million pounds each time it comes. You know, really? a, a season of Game of Thrones would have spent thirty million pounds. What are on, hotels and yeah, hotels all and well, crew. Um, yes, then hotels, facilities, all the supply chain, post-production supply chain, the catering supply chain, all of the same, you know, basic ingredients that, that, that make up this television show, but on a bigger scale. So the money you spend, we get it back tenfold oh, yeah. or whatever. And on, on the big stuff and, and more so. And it's not all big stuff, because you do the local no. stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, and, they, and here the, 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 the key for us in terms of developing the screen industry here is the mix. And it, um, you know, it isn't, and it, it's some of the, if you like, the medium shows that have deeper connection to here, been written and created out of here, yeah. are the ones that we're proudest of. Dairy know. Girls, you were responsible for Dairy yeah. Girls. You were in, yeah, in, well, respo in not responsible, yes, but you were in with Dairy Girls. Yeah, yeah, responsible for, you know, we were a key funder. We've been supporting Lisa McGee, the writer, for a long time in different projects. And that, you know, Dairy Girls is, that's all of our... Christmases at once. Answer me honestly, Richard. Did you think that Dairy Girls would be as big as it became? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. I um, we went to Mipcom, which is in Cannes in the south of France. It's one of the perks of the job, but that's that's one of the big television markets. And we showed a clip. Uh, we had a reception. We showed a clip of Dairy Girls to you know maybe 150 people. And when I saw the response to that clip, I knew it would be a big hit. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. They understood they it. They got they, it. They, they, they absolutely loved it. Now, I didn't know that it would translate for international audiences, for yeah. American audiences, yeah, 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 yeah. but, you know, it very, very clearly did. Um, you know, and we, you know, even now, you can see the long tail of that. Martin Scorsese... <laughs> You know, shouting tweeted, out for Derry yes, Girls. Yes, he tweeted I mean, yesterday. Martin Scorsese said he watched Derry Girls. Absolutely fabulous. So at a some sort of conference in Chicago, uh, he's asked what he's watching on TV at the moment. He says Derry Girls. And you go, <laughs> you know, that's that's just you can't you can't buy that. What sort of publicity. else? Well, what other shows? Give me some other shows. Line of Duty. Yeah, well, Line of Duty, obviously fabulous. Not um, you know not set here, but we think you know Adrian Dunbar and all the fun of looking at the locations we. You know, we we nearly feel like it's set here. Um, I mean, coming up, I mean, there are quite a few projects we've shot over the last couple of years that we still haven't seen. Big, big um, entertainment fantasy adventure project, Dungeons and Dragons, to mm. come out in April. And that's a big, you know, that's a big studio show. Um, Hugh Grant, Chris Pine, you know, big, big names in it. Looking, looking forward to that coming out in the spring. And they're all coming to E Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. How long have you been going now? How long has the whole thing been going? Well, it depends what you take as our as our birth, but about right. 25 years. About. 25 years. So from virtually a standing start 25 yeah. years ago yeah. at the end of the 1990s to now, look at the journey that you've come on. Yeah. And you reckon Blade Runner's coming? I, 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 I certainly do. That's going to be a big That's going to be a big What a great, great story. Richard, thank you so much indeed, and congratulations on all that you've done. Richard Williams, ladies and thank gentlemen. You thank you, Richard. Thank you. There you go. Blade Runner will be enormous when it gets there. Now, I was talking to Richard about uh, about the TV programmes uh, uh, that, that Northern Ireland Screen help fund and develop. Well, another one of them is currently been shown on the BBC. This is the second series of the crime drama Hope Street that was filmed almost exclusively in Donaghadee in County Down. And I'm delighted to say that one of the stars of this show, who plays Sergeant Marlene Pettigrew, is with me now. Would you please welcome the very talented Kerry Quinn. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm great. Gosh, you're looking good, girl. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, you know, I was thinking, when I knew you were coming on, I was thinking, as an actor, how wonderful it must be to get up out of your bed in the morning, to get into the car and to drive a few miles down the road mm -hmm. to the film set, to, to act alongside other Northern Ireland people with the same accent as you. What a dream that is. 
the three speeding tickets put a dampener on it, I'm not going to lie. Three in the space of a week. Um, it's joyous. It is absolutely joyous. And it just, you know, I've been waiting a long time for an opportunity like this and we have just... We are just one big happy family. The time was right, wasn't it, to get something Absolutely. like a soap like this that's going on. It was a slow burner, I have to say. A few people have said that, Mike. I get that. You know, obviously it's new. Um, you know, it's target audience. You know, it, it took a while to just establish everything. But, I mean, the second season, I don't know if anyone's watching it, you know, I think we've definitely hit the ground running. We're, all, right. we're, we're in our groove now. We all are more settled in our characters. And the storylines just keep getting better and better. So it will continue, hopefully, to grow. And Donna Hadi looks unbelievably beautiful. And you forget that it's right there. I know. On and your oh, doorstep. I know, there's such and such, there's such a... Port Divine. Port, Port what, Divine. What a great name. Do you know the other thing I love about it is you don't talk about the troubles. And not everybody's a serial killer because that's all we've ever had coming out of Northern Ireland for the <laughs> past 20 so years. True. I know that's it's, it's a breath of fresh air because it's been done. Um, and yes, obviously, I mean, you still get people on social media saying, you know, there's not enough of this and there's not enough of that. But we do try and keep it as neutral as possible. And I think that's I think that's its beauty. It's simplicity. Yes. It's about relationships, things that we can all, we can all relate to. Um, and I think I think they do it really, really well. I was talking to Richard beforehand, mm -hmm. and he says, Series 3 is a cert. Series 3 is a cert. So there you go. Well, You're, in job. You're in job after Christmas again. I have the money spent and all, so here's open. Do you know what I was watching also Kerry the other night? Kerry was in Derry Girls. We mentioned Derry Girls earlier. There was a cert. She was a cameo uh, appearance in Derry Girls. Mm -hmm. You were the mad Rita, the Pavarotti loving Rita, who <laughs> drove the girls to take that <coughs> concert. Do you remember this scene? Yes. It was hilarious. What fun was there in doing that? Do you know, it was brilliant crack, the girls and the boy were great, but at this, the speed of the thing was so fast, and I was drinking, I was smoking, I was driving, I was crying, I was and, listening to and Pavarotti. And you were cursing? And, and cursing, I'm not going to curse tonight. Like. <laughs> um, and they were going, faster carry, faster for the lines. I was going, mm -hmm, okay, yes, no worries. I just started to panic because obviously the pace of the show was obviously, you know, why people watch it with subtitles. Um, <laughs> and the just kept saying, <clears throat> faster carry, faster. But it was amazing, and it was such a, I mean, the part was so much crack. It was beautiful, great, great part. Right? <laughs> People may also recognise you, I know soap watchers will recognise Kerry, of course, was in Coronation Street for, what, two years? Mm-hmm, roughly what on and off for about two what, years. What was the name? Becky Jeffries. Becky Jeffries, the very one. What happened to her? She died. I'm joking, no, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, she disappeared. She disappeared. She I mean, could have died, for all we know. For, well, this is it. Well, actually, um, Again, Vicky was a, a slow burner when she first started in Coronation Street. I mean, she wasn't particularly likeable. She was cheeky. But were they looking for somebody with a Northern Ireland accent? Yeah. Yes. And it was it was after Come Home. I did the BBC drama Come Home, and they kind of they liked the character. They thought she'd be great on the street to trail her Tracy Barlow, <laughs> which I did. Um, <clears throat> so, and then they started to soften her, and they put her in that kind of love triangle with um, yes, Michelle mom. and Robert. Yes, yes. Um, and they grew to really like her. So they thought my contract had, um, my, con my contract was up. And I'd left, we had a leaving party, myself and Kim went out and got drunk, and then- You and Kim Marsh. Me and Kim Marsh went out, because we kind of finished the storyline at the same time. So we, we went out and got hammered, and then about two weeks later, we were like, do you want to come back? I mean, yeah, I'll come back, yeah. <laughs> no bother, <laughs> do you don't have to ask me twice. And then lockdown happened. So there, oh. I don't know what the storyline was, but there was talk that we're going to bring Vicky back with wee baby Sonny and Tyler. And, and could I, that still happen? I don't know. Would you I like mean, it to happen? Well, I suppose now I've kind of fallen in love with, with Marling and Hope Street, so yes. that, that's my priority. But never say never. How did you get that job? Was that an, an open audition <clears> or what? The Coronation Street job? As I say, it happened shortly after. They brought me in to read for a part that... I mean, I think I was too young for. Right. Um, <laughs> but they said, no, th that's not actually the character. We're, we're just hoping to find you something. And it was shortly okay. after, like five weeks later, Vicky Jeffries um, oh, right. was presented to me and I started to say no. What was it like entering the street? And, uh, you know, it was an institution. It's a television institution. It was terrible. Like, you know everybody. My first scene was with Peter Barlow. I remember I was shaking. I was actually shaking because I thought he was hot. And, um, and my first line was, I thought that was you. Remember, you were short. And he was really short. He was really, really tiny in real oh, life. I was going to turn over and go, what's this about? 
But what a gentleman. And within five minutes, I just felt so at home. They welcomed me with open arms. And it's something I, I will always hold close to my heart. They, they're just amazing people to work with. And you, you feel valued every day. This was a job that most actors would give the right teeth to get. I used to spoof to taxi drivers and all that. I've, I've done this and I've done that. And then when I actually landed the part in Carnation Street, I was like, I don't have to lie about it anymore. I can actually say I, I was in Carnation Street. I spoofed for years that it was. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping they hadn't watched it. <laughs> How did it all start for you, Kerry? Well, what age were you when you decided that, you know, acting's for me? I was in secondary school because I was a really, really cheeky child, like a really cheeky child. And then when I hit about 13, I, it settled and it was, I, I was a nice kid. But at no <laughs> confidence, I had no conf confidence at all. And I used to watch the kind of GCSE drama girls do their shows and I was like, that's amazing, I want to do that. And so I, I said to my drama teacher, Mrs. Mayer, um, I want to I wanna do some plays and she let me, she gave me some parts. And I just kind of went from there. I always kind of loved singing when I was younger. Um, but it was in secondary school and with the help of Mrs. Mayer and um, people like Aidan Brown and Malcolm Smith and, and stuff like that really, really helped me just kind of go for it because so they believed in me. Did you train? Did you go to... Did you go to I did the performing arts course at you Biffy. Did, you did that? Which was some of the happiest years of my life. And then I went on and did the top up year at Queen's. And yeah, it was more academic, but I, I loved it. And then I was just like... It's actually quite arrogant to me. I was like, I'm done studying. I don't want to write another essay. I, I want to get into the room. I want to learn. I want to learn on my feet. And that's what I did. And I took a while. So I had, I had to knock on a few doors. And then after a while, just theatre work started happening. Like people like Martin Lynch and Paul Giorelli and stuff like that. And Paula McFetridge. And I've done some amazing you local have, productions. You have done some that amazing I'm very stuff. grateful for. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for you having me. Are you looking forward to Christmas? I am. Well, I've a busy Christmas now. I'm singing in the Cabaret Supper Club in Belfast. You have to come down for your tea. Your you? boss has told me to come down and have your tea, get you drunk some Sunday. So, <laughs> yes, we're all invited. <laughs> There's one, an invitation for everybody in the audience. <laughs> Kerry, have a great Christmas. Thanks you so too, Jerry. Thanks Kerry so much. Kerry Quinn, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Just sit there, just sit there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just stay there because we're going to take a break. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. Bye. Hi, I'm Carlos Leganauskas. I am. I do level two FDQ professional cookery in the Belfast Met. I am doing catering for the Jerry Kelly Show. My dreams is to open a restaurant myself and. Visit Antrim Town Centre and the award-winning Antrim Castle Gardens and make magical memories like never before. Embrace the giant Christmas spirit and experience the Enchanted Winter Garden. Book your tickets at EnchantedWinterGarden.com Brought to you by Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council. Let the good times roll at Super Strikes at the Jet Centre. You can now book your lane online. We've got 14 bowling lanes and four mini bowling lanes. Plus we serve delicious hot food and snacks. Discover bowling today at the Jet Centre. Jet Centre, entertainment for everyone.
an unmissable new season of shows to enjoy at the Grand Opera House in 2023. From West End and Broadway musicals to thrilling drama and many more sensational productions. Book your tickets at goh.co.uk. Nestled in the Castle Ray Hills, you'll find Hillmount Garden Centre. Whether you're looking for winter plants to brighten your garden, a real Christmas tree or new Christmas decorations, you'll find it at Hillmount. There's gifts for all the family and gift vouchers for that one friend who's so difficult to buy for. There's everything from barbecues to pizza ovens and garden furniture. And you can shop these online too at hillmount.co.uk. After all the shopping, stop in at the Gardener's Rest and relax with a warming cuppa or enjoy a festive feast. Hillmount Garden Centre, Upper Braniel Road, Belfast. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, no run up to Christmas here on this show would be complete without a visit from one of my favourite artists. For more than 30 years, Tommy Fleming has been beguiling audiences all over the world with his unique and natural singing talents. He's due to play a few concerts in Northern Ireland early in the new year, but I'm delighted to say that Tommy is with us tonight. We'll chat shortly, but first, with the beautiful I'm Watching Over You, would you please welcome the brilliant Tommy Fleming. Tommy, come on over. How are you? I'm very, very well. 
Thank you. That, Thank that you. Is, that's a beautiful song. I'm watching over you. Is there a story behind it? Is there is a, a wee story. Um, it just shows you how long I've been up in Belfast. I'm using the word wee. Um, <laughs> the, I, I got that song in 2014. I was actually working in Australia in 2014. And I was working with a really great friend of mine called Hugh Scott Murray. Huey. And two, three o'clock in the morning, we were in the foyer of the hotel after a show. And there was an upright piano we're in the middle of nowhere in Australia. Geelong was the name of the area. And uh, Huey, a few glasses of wine on board, and Huey goes over playing the piano in the corner and he starts singing this song. Asked him what the song was and he explained that the song, he wrote the song just after his dad had died. Um, his father had only died six months previous to that. And his dad had a very long illness and he wrote the song as a tribute, as a salute to the care team that took care of his father. Lovely. So... He gave me a copy of the song, which I lost a month later. I couldn't find it. Completely forgot about it until the summer before last when we were recording the All These Years album. Yes. And I just thought after the, the last three years we've had, or nearly, nearly three years, not full three years, that we've had, I just thought that's... It really, resonates. It resonates. It resonates. What, what, what were you doing through those past COVID years? I did everything. I tried to keep myself as busy as possible. The beginning of it, actually, Jerry, was OK for me. Because I finished touring on the 2nd of March 2020 and okay. I had finished, I was done, I was off. Right. So lockdown for us happened on the 12th of March. And so I basically just kind of, it, it seemed like a, a very long Christmas <laughs> when we started it. And it wasn't that bad for us. The second time around, I found... Tougher. I found it awful. It, yeah. it, it knocked me sideways, I'll be honest. Didn't you have a birthday during that? I had a birthday during the second, that was 19, I'm oh, sorry, 19, um, 2000, where am I? 2021, I turned 50. Um, and was that all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was it like turning 50, Tommy? Where, I, 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 I actually, does it annoy I, I, you? No, I actually, I prefer turning 50 than turning 40. Right. I don't know why, I can never explain that one. Um, I... I think it's kind of, I've, everything that was happening those two years, you kind of, if the worst thing that ha it's happening turning 50, there's an awful lot of people that were deprived of that luxury. Of course. Um, of course. So that's, that kind of helped it. Um, I, I actually liked, I like coming into my 50s. I've got to a point, and you probably disagree with me because you've known me as long as you have. I've got to a point in my 50s where I'm, um, I'm more relaxed. Um, I, I say more often it is what it is. I don't panic about things anymore. I don't stress. I don't fret about things. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot bigger things going on in the world than what we think our problems are. So I've got to a point that I am... Um, I'm actually enjoying it. Enjoying life. I'm enjoying, enjoying life. I'm, enjoy I'm very... I'm, 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 I've become easygoing. I know you find that very hard to <laughs> You've become even more fun. Uh, uh, what about the voice? To me, it's sounding better than ever, even with the years. Um... I mean, is there a peak? Is there an age where... Oh God, I don't know. I hope... I hope not. I hope not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sing. I, I love singing. Um, it's never a job to me. Going on the stage and all of that, that's part of the job, but yes, and putting the show together. But the actual performing or the singing the song, um, I still do it even when I'm off. I still... Yeah. I'm in the car and I'm singing. I'm... I, if I'm on the surfboard, I'm singing. If I'm, um, and to explain that, I live right beside the beach, just in case you think I've just, I've just got a surfboard in the living room and I jump <laughs> on it. Um, I, I love singing. Do you know one of my favourite things is, you know the lo when you're in the local pub and the pint of Guinness is there and the crack is 90, the great musicians in the corner and you go in and sit down with them and the sing song starts. That's... And you do that? Oh, in the I pub. do it all the time. Yeah, that's heaven to me. But you're the professional singer. You shouldn't be doing that. But I had to start somewhere. That's what. That was my college. That was my. That was my apprenticeship. But that your real my... apprenticeship, surely? Yes. Okay, I understand mm. that's apprenticeship. But I mean, you were asked to join the Dannon way yeah. back in the early '90s, which was the biggest folk group in Ireland at the time. Yes. And the lead vocals up to then was the likes of Mary Black and Maura O'Connell and Dolores, Dolores King. King. And then you were asked to yeah. front that. What a learning curve that must have been for you. It was massive, but you know what? I was 20, I joined Adonan in 1993, and I was 22. So I didn't realise the magnitude of it at oh, 22. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a very different man at 52 than I was at 22. So when I joined Adonan, I had just worked with Phil Coulter as well. That's right. So I came from two very, very different schools of discipline. Phil, who was the ultimate, ultimate, consummate professional, 
opened many, many doors for me from playing in small little pubs and clubs, smoky houses that where you couldn't hear yourself think with the noise. And I went from that to playing in front of 3,000 people in Carnegie mm -hmm. Hall. And then I went from there. That was in, we'll say, November, October, November of 1991. And then in 90, or 92. And then in 1993, January of 93, I got a phone call from Frankie Gavin. In, in the Dunnan. In the Dunnan, to join them on the English tour. No rehearsal. Wow. No, I had to join them in the uh, Royal Concert Hall in Glasgow. Uh, there was no rehearsal. I flew from Galway, and there was a flight from Galway to Glasgow at the time. So I flew from Galway to uh, Glasgow, arrived in at about four o'clock. The show was at eight. Uh, it was part of Celtic Connections. And I had to figure out the songs that I knew that Mary would have done with them, Mary Black or Dolores would have done with them and bring the keys down. And that's, that's how we, that's how Dead Annan started with me. So it was, I came from two very different I understand, schools. but, but were, were your eyes on the solo career really? Oh, completely. Always, always you wanted always, to be a solo yeah, artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was always, I was selfish in my 20s, but more, I think most 20 something year olds were selfish. Of course. I hope they are. Of course. Um, I, um, the, the eye was always on, the right eye was on, well, I'll do that now for a year or two and that'll get me to here. And then there was always that kind of in the periphery. But you also have that as well, because you're known as the voice of Ireland. I don't know where you, that came from, you by will, the way. That's the way it's, if it you, sounds when, like when I'm up and down O'Connell Street <laughs> looking for people's working rights. You've also <laughs> been compared to the great Count John McCormick. Yes, but you're a great your, compliment. But your repertoire is, is wider than that. You don't just stick to the traditional Irish stuff. No, I don't. I, I grew up in a house... Um, in a, in a home that was just full of music, love and music. Um, my dad was a, had a massive, my, both, both my late mother and father had, a, had this massive collection of records, LPs, um, vinyls, yeah. still in the house actually, the home place. And it ranged from the Gallo Glass Cayley band to, nobody will even know who I'm on about, a guy called John Woodhouse who used to play a button accordion. A uh, classical button accordion. Why they had that, I have no idea where it came from. It's probably a collector's item now. And then you'd have, you'd have had Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley. And you listened to all, all of that. that. Uh, Jim Reeves was my mother's favourite. Barbara Streisand was my dad's. You know, a musical theatre was a big thing with my father. Make him and Clancy. I remember going to see a Make him and Clancy concert with my dad when I was nine in the local school hall. And that, I only now, now look back on it and realise that was a huge turning point for me. It was some turning point. It Tommy, was. it's a pleasure. You've, you're a great friend of Northern Ireland. You'd never fail to come. You're coming to uh, Belfast. You're coming to the Ulster Hall I am. on the 17th of February. And you'll be in the Millennium Forum in Derry on the 24th of on February. The 20th. I love, always love coming up. Always. And you're heading off to Australia all before all that. Oh, before that. I'm kind of spending my heart just before Christmas in Australia. I'm going up, as my mother used to say before when I would head off on a tour, if it was only for a few days, it didn't, didn't, didn't matter where it was. He's only going over to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably true. So, yeah, I'm going to Australia for a few days uh, for a PR trip for you the know, tour next you know, year. You know I have you on the programme practically every Christmas. And I asked you to sing one particular song for me every Christmas. Will you sing it for us tonight? Again? I will, and I have to explain this actually because every year we would do the whatever show it was, it would be BBC or Kelly Live, Kelly Show, whatever it might have been, and you would always ask me to do the song. When um, James, my publicist James Rollins, came to me and said, "Jerry wants you to do this, da da da," and he said, "Will you do a Christmas song?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll send it on to you now." To which James said to me. How do you know which one you want? And I said, trust me, I know which one it is. So it's Would you make your way across I there? I'll leave you to explain Leave me it. to explain Listen, it. Listen, thank you, Jerry. Joe, thank, thank you. you, Tommy. I'm I genuinely do ask Tommy to sing this for me. Uh, it's the best version of this song that I've ever heard. And seeing Christmas is only round the corner. This is Tommy Fleming and in the bleak midwinter. Snow on snow 
In the bleak midwinter Long ago Angels and archangels May have gathered there Cherubim and seraphim throng the air. But his mother only in her maiden bliss worship the Tommy, thank you so much indeed, and a very happy, very happy Christmas to you. you uh, folks, that's about it. We have one more show left before Christmas. That'll be next week. But thanks for watching tonight. Until then, bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.